This is Bible Academy. Today we are studying 3rd John, a third epistle called 3rd John. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege that you've given us to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We usually begin a new letter, a new study, with an introduction. This introduction is a little different because it starts with the connection of the three John letters. John, as an apostle, let's just write him up here, Apostle John. As an apostle, at this point in history, he supervised several churches. As an apostle, he had greater authority. Uh, it was the greatest uh, gift, you might say, in a sense of authority. So he could actually be over several churches. We're also in a transition period where churches have not yet been established some are. Some are going through a transition where they end up selecting their own leaders or leader, elder, or elders. Uh, scripture has a different name for them. It might be a pastor, teacher, uh, an elder, uh, some other term that's related to it that's carried over even into our day. The point is, John is an authority over several churches. Now, the church that he's in, we're just going to call it uh, the first church, okay? He's writing this letter to a friend in another church. We'll just call it Gaius's church. And the letter is about, first of all, it's about a man who's in a third church by the name of Diotrephes. This is also one of the first reasons or uh, what we call occasions for this letter. He's going to address the issue of Diotrephes. Now what connects these churches, uh, you have each second and third letter beginning from the elder. And then the second letter connects back to the first letter. We know that the elder here was the beloved John. There's no reason to think it was written by anybody else but him. And all the history background, the point of the church at this time, as well as the writing and style of John, continues on through all three of these epistles. Dating is always difficult to nail down, but as I've discussed this in the other two epistles, we somewhere put this between late 60s to uh, 90s, perhaps early 90s, mid 90s uh, AD. The occasion and purpose. This is a personal letter from the elder John, the apostle to his beloved friend Gaius. In both 1st and 2nd John, we saw that they had a common problem with false teachers. Heresy regarding the person and nature of Jesus Christ. That's not the problem that is discussed in this third letter. Now, what's a little confusing is that we're not so much talking about a third church. Uh, that is, this letter isn't written to a third church. It's written to Gaius, who is in another church. So let me just put it this way. The first church has John. The second church has Gaius. The third church has uh, let me correct that and make sure we got it right. Diotrephes. All right, so there are three churches involved, but the letter is really to Gaius about Diotrephes and about someone else, but we'll get to that later. Diotrephes comes up first in the letter. So that is what the subject is about. Part of it is Diotrephes in a third church. Well, I hope you got that. Diotrephes has maneuvered himself to be the primary leader in his church. 
One of the ways in which he's done this is to control the people. He controls them by saying who comes in, who goes, uh, who, who comes in, who teaches, who's allowed to come into the church and teach. And what he has done, he has become uh, so controlling. We're not told how he does it. There's different ways even men do it today. Usually men, sometimes women, control who teaches and what's being taught at the church. Now, another reason this letter is written, first reason was Diotrephes, is about a man named Demetrius. Demetrius, from everything we can tell here, is a traveling missionary. And he is meeting with John, and John apparently is going to take have D Demetrius take this letter to Gaius. And it's a letter of commendation about Demetrius to Gaius and his church. Let me repeat this. John, let's change colors. John is writing a letter to Gaius in a, we'll just say at the second church, about a man in the third church, um, Diotrephes, all right? Demetrius is in the third church. He's a traveling missionary, but he is the second subject in this letter. And we'll get to it, of course, and I'll explain it as we get to it. All right? I hope that sorts things out. It really helps as you read through this letter and both this interpretation. It's always good to get the names and numbers of the players so we know what's going on. All right, let's begin with verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. There's our word elder again. We studied this somewhat extensively in the previous uh, epistle, that is 2 John. The word is presbuteros. We get the word presbytery, presbyterian, similar words. Normally this is just an older man, but it's been adopted to be the title for a church leader. Uh, we saw that it had been carried over from the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin, where they had their elders and leaders there, but now it becomes a common term for a church leader. In this case, the Apostle John, uh, who keeps his name silent as usual, calls himself the elder, uh, the old man. Uh, we used to call uh, our pastor the old man. I think he got a kick out of that, though we wouldn't say it to his face, but he probably knew that. But he's the old man. He's the one who is a supervisor over these churches. So he's writing to his beloved friend, a good friend of John. He calls him beloved. That's the idea. He's a good friend. Let's talk about Gaius. Who was he? Well, first of all, Gaius is a common name in the ancient world, especially in the Roman world, like we would find John and James in the Jewish world. But there's not enough said about him to link him to any of the other Gaiuses mentioned in Scripture. Uh, a Gaius, uh, let me give you some scriptures for different Gaiuses. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.14, Romans 16.23, Acts 19.29, Acts 24, just in case you want to check that out. There's no reason to connect this Gaius to any of those others. He's described by John, not only as beloved, but he says, whom I love in the truth. Now this has been a big issue in John's writing. Truth. The realm of truth. Abiding in truth. We've learned the importance of obeying the truth. This is the realm in which John loves Gaius. He's a growing, obedient believer who adheres to the truth of God's word. John loves him for it. Uh, we've talked about this earlier in the other epistles, but it is a lot easier, and in fact a joy, 
to love Christians who love the truth. You will find, if you haven't discovered this already, that, and I, I'll just do this, uh, this is my own thing here, okay? There are those Christians who study the Word, read the Word, do the devotions, and then there are those who love the truth. Now they may do some of those same things, but they have an entirely different attitude. Those who love the truth want it every day. They've got to have it. They desire it. They enjoy studying it. They enjoy speaking about it. And they enjoy, when they get to the point where they can use their spiritual gifts, utilizing truth in their ministry. They live by truth. They even talk differently, act differently than those who are always talking about truth but don't really love it. You see, when you love the Word of God, it's not only that you realize you can't do without it, you don't want to do without it. Gaius was one of those. The Apostle John had this in common with his friend Gaius, beloved Gaius. Now, this is a personal letter. It's also what we might call an official letter, even the way it's, uh, it starts from the elder. There's not even a greeting here, which is kind of unusual. So it's probably, we suspect, some church business. And as we read it, we can see that it is uh, church business. Maybe we might call it an official letter. What we have of a greeting, though, is in verse 2. Now remember, he's writing one man. Beloved, I pray that all may be well with you and that you may be in good health, just that it is is as well with your inner spiritual self. It's a little awkward. Let me say that again. Beloved, I pray that all may be well with you and that you be in good health just as it is well with your inner spiritual self. To put it simply, he's making a prayer wish that Gaius is in good physical health as well as good spiritual health. Now let's talk about these words be well. Here, the first line, it is a present passive infinitive. Let's talk about this word because I want you to understand it well. No pun intended. You are dao. You are dao. It means basically to prosper or succeed. It's used four times in the New Testament. Here you see them listed. Romans 1.10, 1 Corinthians 16.2, 3 John 2. It's used twice. All right. Here's the usage, usages. One, succeed in making a journey. Romans 1.10. But you might succeed in making your journey. You might make it, you see. Two, a measure for what is saved and put aside for contributions. It's in 1 Corinthians 16.2. Thirdly, it's used for praying for someone's well-being, our verse, 3 John 2, in all things and in inner self. And here in our passage, it's used for one's general well-being. So, he's praying, wishing that he has good well-being, and then he also says, and that you be in good health, present, active, infinitive, of Hugiano, good health, well to be sound, metaphorically, for sound faith, doctrine, teaching words. We see that 
used that way in Titus 1.13 and 2 Timothy 4.3. But here it's being used that he just might be doing succeeding in his life, being prosperous, and be in good health. That's the idea. Now, does this mean that guys had some health issues? Possibly. But you could also say something like this to anyone who is in perfectly good health. And then he says also, and don't miss this, his comparison, just that it is well with your inner self. And I entered the, per the word spiritual for interpretive purposes. Because now he's talking about the inner spiritual life. This is the word suke, the inner self, the inner immaterial part of man, the inner life. This is the immaterial part of a person in combination with the material part. It makes you a whole person. Um, it is the emphasis of life. By that I mean when it comes to who you are, this is, you are the suke. People usually don't call you a body, they call you a life. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. When it comes between the body and the inner self, who you are is the suke. That's probably the simplest explanation for this word. Obviously, you can see we get the word psyche from it, or psych. Here it's referring to his spiritual health. So John is wishing, while praying, that Gaius may be in overall good health. He may be doing well, both physically and spiritually. As you can see, it's a different greeting than what we're used to. Now, let me just say this. <laughs> I almost have to laugh because it's, it's so pathetic. When I've heard those who teach prosperity teaching say this is the verse that we use. One of the verses they use that God wants you prosperous. That he wants you healthy. Uh, so, they use this verse for the uh, health and wealth gospel. Well, folks, anybody who studies this in context can see it's just a greeting. Uh, we do this all the time. Well, I hope you're doing well. Have a good day. Uh, that's not saying... God's going to give you a good day. He's going to give you good health. He's going to give you prosperity. Uh, I wanted to mention that because that's just one of many distortions they have with the scripture. Well, John has had a good report about Gaius. Verse 3. For I was very glad when... Brethren came and testified to your truth, just as you are walking in truth. There we have the word truth again. The Apostle John rejoiced when he heard some fellow Christians tell him about Gaius. They came and testified, both present participles, indicating this happened more than once, or that it kept on occurring. People would come to John and he might say, oh, you've been to that particular church or you've seen Gaius. How's he doing? And they'll tell him how well he's doing. And this is what John is reporting back to Gaius in this letter. Notice, to your truth, just as you are walking in truth. There we have it again. This is a man who loves the truth, who walks in truth, who lives by the truth. Of course, this is biblical truth, God's truth. Just as you are walking in truth, so they testify to his truth just as he is living by it. And of course, walking is figurative for living. So Gaius was living in the truth. He was learning the right things, Bible doctrine, and applying it in his daily life. Now I must say, this is always one of the first things a pastor wants to hear about someone he cares for. That they're not caught up into some false teaching that they're not straying from God in some sin, but rather they've been living by the truth, by the word of God. Verse 4. 
expresses his thoughts further, that is, John does, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Well, there you have it. Nothing can make John happier than hearing this about my children. Here we see he considers those who are under his authority as uh, dear ones, uh, people he really cares for. John groups Gaius in with other believers. Not only is he responsible for them, but he cares about them dearly. He describes again walking in the truth, living by God's word. I want to read this verse again. Put yourself in the sandals of an apostle who may have several hundred people spread out over several churches. Here's his great joy. I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth, living by truth. One of the things that I enjoy is when someone writes me a letter, email, long or short, I don't care, and just tell me how much they enjoy living by the truth. And you know how I know they know that? Because they say, I really like the teaching. And I'm not saying just because it's mine, but because it's the Word of God. You relate to me that you love the Word of God through your response to it. That's very important. Verse 5. Beloved, again talking to Gaius, you are acting faithfully in whatever you do for the brethren, even though they are strangers. Now John is shifting subjects a little bit. He's talked about Gaius walking in the truth. He's got a good testimony about him that he hopes he's doing well physically and spiritually. And now he's saying something about he's heard about him. You're acting faithfully in whatever you do for the brethren, the other brothers and sisters in Christ, even though they're strangers. Now what's this all about? Well, let's work through it. Beloved, again, means loved one, a good friend. You're acting faithfully. Acting is a common word we have. It's we usually translated do or make. It has the idea of produce. It's poyeo. And then the word faithfully. Basically, this is the word for faithful. Uh, pistos. Trustworthy, faithful, loyal. John is telling Gaius that he's acting faithfully. This would go two ways. Towards God and that he is faithful, living by the word of God in his life. And, second part of our verse, when he says, And whatever you do for the brethren. He's living faithfully and acting faithfully toward believers. He is loyal to them. He's showing his love with them. This would be acts of showing love. Remember, love is active. It shows acts of love. And he does this regularly towards the brethren. He's acting as a Christian should act towards other Christians. Now, more specifically, even though they are strangers, so this would be those who show up, he gives them the benefit of the doubt that they're Christians. He treats them like Christians. These are, of course, Christians that he doesn't know personally. Now remember, John has called them brethren, even though they are strangers. So these would be strangers who are Christians. When we see a Christian being faithful to another Christian, we know that that person who is being faithful knows what faithfulness means. He understands and instinctively treats his brothers and sisters in Christ as a Christian should. Now by that I mean he doesn't have to really think about it. This is what we do. This is not only what I'm supposed to do, but this is who I am. Others can observe that and say he is really 
good towards Christians, even those he doesn't know. In verse 6, John continues good words about Gaius. They have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. So these believers who Gaius does not know uh, had talked to John and the local church about Gaius. And now John wants Gaius to understand when they come back through to treat them in a manner worthy of God. Why would he say this? Well, this is where we're going to get to the heart of the letter here in a moment. So understand, Gaius is known for treating Christians well, even those who are traveling through, stopping off at the church, and now he wants this, John wants this reputation of treating Christians well to continue. When they come back that way, and then he says, You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. And what this means is when they come through and they practice Christian hospitality, they may spend the night there, maybe a couple of nights. Maybe they got a message about how the gospel is spreading in their area and they bring that to the church or they have some fresh teaching from John they want to pass on. John tells Gaius that he, that is Gaius, had a good reputation for treating traveling Christians well. And now John wants Gaius to continue that good treatment towards others coming his way. Now we don't think about this, but doing this, that is treating them well in a manner worthy of God, included providing provisions enough until their traveler's next stop. So when they left your house, you would gather up some food and water, whatever they would need uh, to get them to their next destination. Now that's hospitality. There's a point of application here. Christians are to support ministers and traveling missionaries well and provide them support. Now, I'm going to say something that I may regret. I usually don't. My experience has been, both in Christians and as a missionary pastor when I first started out uh, out of seminary, that most Christians are not very generous with their money. I'm not picking on anyone in particular here. But as a general rule, many Christians are pretty stingy. Uh, it's been said to me and even in churches where uh, some of the elders, uh, misled as they are, they believe that pastor teachers ought to have their own full-time jobs besides their ministry. They don't understand that the more time a pastor has to study and teach, the more they get taught the word deeply and thoroughly. But usually the people who say things to that like that uh, don't care anyway. They're usually just religious. That's been my other experience too. They're always religious. By that I mean they really don't understand what it means to live by the Spirit and live obedient lives. And it's always better to be generous with your support than be, uh, well down here we call them a skin flint or stingy. I can almost guarantee you that anybody out there in the mission field is always needing more support. Uh, it's a real pain to have to be concerned about your support when you're trying to do ministry. Now you do trust the Lord for it, don't misunderstand. But there are some principles here that we don't understand. This was common. This was common to do this. So a person travels from this town to that town. Might take them three, two or three days. You make them some sandwiches. You, of course, I'm not. They do it in those days. Maybe they did. But anyway, you give them some bread. You give them what they need. 
uh, supplies to get over there. Maybe their blanket's worn, you give them a new blanket. Maybe their cloak's worn, you give them a new cloak. Uh, don't give them your old worn out one. That's often secondhand stuff. I've seen that too many times from church people. They give their secondhand stuff, stuff that's out of style, stuff they want to get rid of. So they pile it on some poor missionary or some new pastor who comes to a church and he needs certain things. Why are they doing that? Is that what you do for your own family members? What you would do for yourself? Is that love? Well, I think you get the idea. After all, any maturing Christian knows that giving is an offering to God from his believer priesthood. In John 7, John gives us one of the reasons these traveling missionaries should be supported. Now listen to this. It's an important point. Many applications. Speaking of these traveling missionaries, for they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Nothing. I have a tendency to cut words short down here. For they went out. That's the idea. John is explaining something about these missionaries. With this information, it looks like this couple or more are traveling missionaries. He uses the word they. That's the plural, obviously. So it may be a husband and wife or a couple of men or other uh, combinations, a uh, man, woman. Uh, uh, you wouldn't probably see that very often, but uh, it's a team. A missionary team. Maybe have two or three who go out. Uh, a couple of women and a man or something like that. But uh, I wouldn't expect a lot of women to travel by themselves simply because of the dangers. At any rate, the man we're talking about here, as we're going to meet him in a few minutes, uh, he is to be taken care of. Why? Because he goes out for the sake of the name. Now the word name, we've studied this many times, represents the person, the character. Here, I think it refers to Jesus Christ. Some might say it refers to God, but that seems a little bit out of uh, the flow of things when we get into the context like this. And in so doing, notice one of the things they do. When they go out and they're operating uh, for Christ, they're representing him as his ambassador. Now if you know anything about ambassadors, uh, ambassadors represent uh, their country as well as sometimes they speak for their president. Uh, the embassy is considered property of the country in which they represent. You've probably seen enough movies or, know, or you, maybe you know by experience that you walk into a, a United States embassy, you're on American property, protected by, at least overseas, is protected by Marines. I used to know some Marines that used to do that. They had some interesting stories. I considered that duty myself, but I'd had to stay in longer to do it. It's quite, quite a prestigious position, but there's been some awful uh, incidents in embassies over many years. Or Marines weren't allowed to do what they were trained to do. And the embassy fell. Or the people were captured. Well, that's another story. It's many stories, in fact. So, these missionaries represented Jesus as his representative. They are ambassadors of Christ. And in doing so, notice they accepted nothing from the Gentiles. Now what's this all about? Well, let's talk about Gentiles for a moment and the way it's being used here. I'll put the word up there. We'll look at it. Ethnikos. Ethnikos. It's an adjective here. The idea is that they live like Gentiles. So Gentiles represents unbelievers or pagans. So is an important point. These missionaries do not take any support from those they are evangelizing. These missionaries do not take any support from those they are evangelizing. 
today, they wouldn't pass the plate. If you know what I mean. First of all, that would take away from the principle of grace by which the gift of salvation is offered. Salvation is free. Totally free. Paid for by Christ. God paid for your salvation with the life of his own son. Secondly, in those days, it's not also it's also true in our days. When you have visiting speakers in those days they'd have visiting philosophers that go around and they they would earn their living by talking. And they would give all their ideas and their human wisdom and their different uh, philosophy, philosophies about life and purpose and you know people were probably looking for answers but this is in the wrong place and these philosophers they would expect payment for what they did and you didn't want to appear like one of those if you're a traveling missionary you also find that among religious people who want payment for their services if I'm going to come and preach, then you've got to pay me. Uh, now, it's not that we shouldn't. Travel expenses, you know, just the fact that they put work into that. I've, I've done a number of uh, fill-ins for pastors over the years. The pastor had left and they didn't have anybody or uh, even candidating for a church. And people usually paid uh, for the time, but most don't understand how much time you spend on a sermon. Uh, some are generous, some are pretty stingy. But you don't go there for the money. You go there to minister. And you leave the finances in God's hands. For those of you who have to do that. Now, let's talk about Paul. How did he approach this when it came to receiving financial support? There were times, in fact, he's probably known more for not taking financial support than, than that he did. And it really comes out in the immature church of Corinth. I almost want to call that the first immature church of Corinth. They had so many problems, chapter after chapter. In fact, more problems, even half chapters after half chapter, there's another problem they have to deal with. All right, all sorts of Abuses, wrongdoings, lack of discipline, um, a number of things. Uh, Christians taking other Christians to court, abusing their spiritual gifts, abusing the communion table. I mean, the list goes on and on. Paul didn't want to take money from them. You know why? Because sure enough, someone would be accusing him of being in ministry for money. So Paul avoided it altogether. 1 Corinthians 9, 12. He would not take financial help from these people. But there were times when he did take support. Philippians 4, 16. We're going to look at that passage later because there's other things that I want you to see. Now here's an additional point. Christian missionaries or ministries should not be taking support towards their ministry from unbelievers. This stems off of the point we just saw that uh, Christian traveling missionaries or evangelists don't take funds from the unbeliever that they're evangelizing. <clears throat> Once the evangelized become believers, they fall under the principles of supporting materially those who do this kind of work. Now, I'm not saying, now just listen carefully, this is how someone would misconstrue this, that as soon as they accept Christ, you pass the plate. No, that's silly, that's terrible uh, tact. Let them grow. 
the thing you emphasize with new believers is that they need to get into a Bible teaching situation. Now, I would say church, but the problem is they're so rare today. They need to start growing in the Word, and you lead them to where they can grow in the Word. And then as they grow in the Word, as they mature, they'll realize that part of their priesthood is to support materially those who teach them the Word. So get the two points here. Christian missionaries or ministries should not be taking support toward their ministry from unbelievers. Period. As these people become believers and they fall under um, the authority of somebody that's teaching them the Word of God, then they can give to those they want to support. Let's take a few points on this. You know, this is one of those subjects that I'm not particularly fond of, but at the same time, I have to teach it because it's part of the Word of God. And when it comes up, I teach it. Let's look at some points on ministry support. Um, there is a lot of confusion on that. Let's get some clear principles down. I was very bothered when I heard years ago of a very well-known ministry that took support from unbelievers. I, I just couldn't even begin to fathom why they would do that. But that was standard for them. Number one on ministry support. Support for Bible teachers is commanded of believers. Galatians 6.6 6. Two. When we share in supporting Christian ministries, we share in the ministry as fellow workers. Look at our verse. 3 John 8. One of our verses, in fact, isn't it the verse we're on right now? <laughs> I kind of lost track. Uh, no, it's the next verse. Okay, well, we'll get there, and we'll see it in some detail. But I'm trying to put several general principles together here. Now, these are related, but they're kind of scattered at the same time. But these are principles we should have. Point two again, when we share in supporting Christian missionaries, we share in the ministry as fellow Workers, notice, as fellow workers, co-workers. Um, I'll emphasize this right now. When you give to a ministry, when you pray for a ministry, when you support it financially, materially, however you do, you share in that work. You're part of that work. You're part of building that building of Christian faith in believers, hearts and minds. I can't think of a better investment. Three, in contrast, now listen to this. This is a couple of points here that's kind of, it's related. Sharing or partnering with unbelievers, even in a general sense, like business, is inadvisable. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 18. To be very careful who you partner with in close association. Remember, they're unbelievers, they're in the world, their values are in the world. Now, you may share some of their morality. Yes, you might. But down deep, you better be ready to be betrayed, turned on, sued, whatever you do in business. We're warned about that. Four. Furthermore, Partnering in close association like Christian mission would be a clear violation of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 6.14 um, I just realized I gave you the wrong reference on 3. That should be 2 Corinthians oh, Let me try this again. Here we are. On 3, it's 2 Corinthians 6, 12 through 18. Verse 4, or point 4 is right, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. So you have general advice, don't partner up with unbelievers, but when it comes to Christian mission, absolutely not. 5, notice this one. Every teaching on contributing to Christian ministries or missionaries is always from believers to believers. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11, Galatians 6, 6, Philippians 4, 15 through 17. I said we look at this verse 
earlier when talking about Paul. Let's look at Philippians 4.15 through 17. And as you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the beginning of the gospel ministry, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So the Philippians have helped Paul. Not that I'm seeking a gift, but I'm seeking the credit that super increases to your account. So this tells us Paul's perspective on it. I'm not looking for your money. I'm not looking for your help. But when you do, I see that be credited to your account. And this basically means towards God. God keeps track of what you give to those who serve in ministry, and you get credit for it. That's the verse. I studied this in detail in Philippians. That super increases to your account. It's like bonus. When you give to a Bible teaching ministry, a ministry that is in truth, all right, a missionary, traveling missionaries, uh, people setting up Bible teaching churches, that type of thing, uh, in your church that's teaching the Bible, that super increases to your account. Our final point, point six, I'll do this by itself here. There should always be good motives behind the giving, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and not lied about. Now, this is just sort of a, uh, an incident that happened in Scripture, Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied about what they were giving. Uh, there's some subtle application here. Don't try to impress people with what you give. It's best to give anonymously, if you can. Now, often, Christians are to support, uh, it's mentioned in Scripture that Christians are support saints in need. I want to just kind of write out the picture. This is not necessarily to missionaries or missionary pastors, but it could be. This is any saint in need. We see this very early in the church, Acts 2, 42 through 45, 11, 29, Romans 12, 13. Um, I put that twice for some reason. 15, 26 through 27, 1 Corinthians 16, 3, 2 Corinthians 8, 4. All right? So, let's go back to our verse again. Verse 7, talking about the traveling missionaries. For they went out for the sake of the name, for Jesus Christ as his ambassador, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. I want you to understand that Christian ministries have no business taking money from unbelievers. Why would you do that? That sends them the wrong signal. It sends others the wrong signal. Your ministry should be one of grace. These dedicated traveling missionaries went out on account of Jesus Christ, and in doing so, they would not accept any material or financial support from the unbelievers they evangelized. That should be clear. In verse 8, John makes his point to Gaius about these traveling missionaries and all believers' obligation. Again, remember, John's writing to Gaius, and now he's writing about these traveling missionaries. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may become co-workers with the truth. Now, when I say men here, I think that's generic. It could be men and women. Notice the word we. This is the first word in the sentence. 
when you see a first word in a sentence like this kind of out of place, we, therefore, that's the idea in the Greek. It's emphatic. That would be John and his fellow Christians. This principle is for all Christians. Those with John, those he's writing. The principle is for all Christians ought to support such men. And there's a result. Notice, so that we may become co-workers with the truth. Don't ever forget that. Let's talk about it. The word become, present middle subjunctive of genomai. Genomai means to be born, created, come into existence. One shows that he is a co-worker with the missionaries by supporting them. Look at the words in this verse again. Therefore we ought to support such men, traveling missionaries in the truth. This is specific so that we may become co-workers with the truth. Those who are out there in the mission field, and I include those on the internet, reaching out to the world wherever it gets to, their ministry, when you join with them in support, you become a co-worker with the truth. Talk about the word co-worker for a moment. Sunergos. A couple of words in the Greek here put together. Worker or work. And the uh, prefix soon with. Somebody with them. Your co-worker. And what better thing to be a co-worker with than the truth. So that we may become co-workers with the truth. Now, let's talk about the truth here. Obviously, it's the God's Word. But also could include the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. Certainly, the Holy Spirit's involved in a Bible teaching ministry, an evangelistic ministry where one is going out and spreading the gospel. The believer living by the power of the Spirit contributes to ministries with the Spirit active in his life. The believer living by the power of the Spirit contributes to ministries with the Spirit or while the Spirit is active in his life. To put it another way, when we support Christian mission and teachers of the Word, we are living and abiding in the realm of truth. We are learning the truth and applying it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's the application. We'll close with this. When we support Christian ministries who serve with truth, we also share that ministry with truth. It's about truth, folks. It's about truth. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word and the challenge you've given us today in so many ways. Father, as we hear these words spoken, we ask that the Spirit of God will so move in our hearts and minds that we'll not only understand them, but we will apply them walking in the truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.